The hype is real for sodium ion batteries, and rightfully so. They're on track to seriously disrupt the dominance of lithium ion batteries due to their promised low cost. But after hearing mixed things about their future, I wasn't sure what to believe. However, I think I found the missing piece of information, a patent from battery giant CATL explaining their reinforced sodium ion cells, which I believe is the key to sodium ion beginning its market expansion. The reinforced cathode in these cells is what appears to have taken cheap and abundant sodium ion from a distant dream to a reality. And in this video, I want to cut through the noise and give a clear overview of why CATL are suddenly going all in on their second generation sodium ion batteries, and what it means for the transport and energy sectors. As always, I respect your time, so let's get straight into this. I'm Ryan Innes, and this is a Xeroth Deep Dive. The main story here is that CATL have developed a new additive, which reinforces their cells and makes it possible to cheaply mass manufacture them. But there's a lot more to this, and it requires a quick recap to fully make sense. Sodium ion batteries offer a few benefits compared to conventional lithium ion. These include the potential to be much cheaper, operate at extreme temperatures, be made from abundant and sustainable materials, and have improved safety. The general working principle is similar to conventional lithium ion, where ions trade between the anode and cathode, storing and releasing energy in the process, with a key difference being that sodium ions are larger than lithium ions. Despite the numerous possible benefits, this video is going to focus mostly on cost, because that's what attracts the mainstream to sodium ion. The cost savings will come primarily from removing the need for lithium, but also by using cheaper materials elsewhere in the cell. The ability to operate at extreme temperatures is also very interesting, as it means electric vehicles could start in the deep cold, and grid storage systems wouldn't need such elaborate temperature control systems. But the low temperature operation is a less controversial point, and has proven to be true, so it's not the focus of this video. What I really wanted to understand is what's happening to bring down the prices of sodium ion cells, and what are the trade-offs? This is what eventually led me to CATL's hidden breakthrough. But to understand that, I needed to know what current sodium ion batteries were offering and lacking apart from cold weather performance and the promise of low costs. From reading around, the main concerns from a technical perspective, besides the lower energy densities, appeared to be efficiency and how the available voltage of sodium ion cells drops as they discharge. Efficiency is obvious, as we want to keep as much of that hard-earned energy as possible, but the voltage characteristics are a little less obvious. If we look at a graph showing the voltage of a lithium iron phosphate battery cell, which is the current budget chemistry, you can see that as it discharges from 100% state of charge to zero, the voltage of the cell stays pretty stable. This is useful as it means the power electronics don't have to be designed for a wide range of voltages. And if you want to pull out a constant amount of power, the current you need to pull from it remains relatively constant. However, the same can't be said for many sodium ion cells. In a cell tested by Will Prowse in one of his many informative videos, he found the voltage dropped significantly as the battery discharged. This is annoying when designing power electronics as they have to allow for a large voltage range. But it also means that for a constant power demand, the current draw from the battery would keep going up as it discharged, because the power is equal to current times voltage. So, as the voltage goes down, to balance it, the current has to go up. High currents are unwanted, as they lead to lower efficiencies, more heat being generated, and require more expensive power electronics to manage the system. This is all on top of the fact that sodium ion cells are generally less efficient anyway, 
because sodium ions are larger and therefore have more internal resistance as they move through the cell. So, to recap, sodium ion cells are less energy dense, have voltages that are harder to manage, are less efficient, and, on top of that, with current manufacturing, they aren't even any cheaper. In fact, they usually cost more than the cost-effective lithium iron phosphate cells available today. So you can see why some people might be a bit skeptical. But what this doesn't fully account for is CATL's new patented reinforced sodium ion cathode. As cost is the biggest factor here, I dug into the figures a little further and found a recent study from Stanford, which it turns out Jordan Giesecke from the Limiting Factor YouTube channel had already found for a fantastic analysis on his channel. The study showed that despite having cheaper raw materials, the final cell cost for sodium ion is still considerably higher, on average, than lithium iron. And it predicts that this might not change for some time yet. But I think some of these timelines could be accelerated thanks to CATL's new reinforced sodium ion cathode. This breakthrough is important because the cathode affects everything, including the cell voltage, efficiency, density, and the manufacturing cost. It's worth noting that current sodium ion cells already have different voltage characteristics. For example, layered oxide cathodes have steeper drops, like the one we saw earlier. But cathode materials like Prussian white are already much flatter, which may be partially why CATL had previously used them in their first generation sodium ion battery pack. Prussian white cathodes can also be made using similar production methods to the ones CATL have been using for lithium ion phosphate cells, meaning factories and skill sets have to be adapted less. Specifically, these processes are ones that use a water-based slurry to make the electrode. This makes Prussian white highly compatible with existing infrastructure, reducing manufacturing costs, and simplifying large-scale production. So Prussian white seemed like a good option. It had a nice flat-ish voltage profile, and it had already reached a respectable 160 watt-hours per kilogram. And on top of that, manufacturing wasn't unreasonable compared to their current major production lines and expertise. But I believe that CATL didn't think that these energy densities were going to be enough, and Prussian white as a cathode sets a ceiling on energy density that I think was just too low. To reach the scale of production needed to make sodium ion cost competitive, they need to be used in electric vehicles, because electric vehicles make up 80% of all lithium ion battery production. This is where the new reinforced cathode comes in from their patent. I do want to point out that CATL have many patents and breakthroughs around sodium ion cells, including a self-forming anode, which also boost energy density. But what makes the reinforced cathode the most important is that it allows these high energy density layered oxide cathodes to be more cheaply mass manufactured. The problem with traditional layered oxide cathodes is that they not only produce the unwanted voltage drop during discharge, as seen by Will Prowse, but they are also harder and more expensive to manufacture. This is because they require a special solvent, which is toxic and expensive. So although these layered oxide cathodes have higher energy densities, they're harder to manufacture and have less than ideal voltage characteristics. But what if we could make these high energy density cathodes easier to manufacture and have better voltage curves? That would mean we could cheaply manufacture them and they would be suitable for the huge electric vehicle market, enabling economies of scale to take effect. Well, that's probably what CATL thought and what led them to the reinforced cathode breakthrough. The patent described how the addition of antimony, represented by the symbol SB, reinforced the traditional layered oxide cathode, 
This is a game changer that I believe led CATL to push forward with sodium ion in a serious way. For example, their new sodium ion batteries designed to start truck engines or power full EVs. Specifically, the added antimony means the layered oxide cathodes are water resistant, so they don't get destroyed during low cost, water based manufacturing processes. This means they can be made using the same processes as lithium ion phosphate cells, reducing costs further. In the patent, you can see results from an X ray diffraction analysis where the sample is tested before and after being immersed in water. The exact meaning of the results is not important, but we can see for the standard layered oxide that the peaks are much more intense before being immersed in water than after. However, for the reinforced cathode, it shows little difference before and after being immersed, meaning it behaves much more similarly before and after water exposure. This seemingly small change to the chemistry changes everything for the economics of sodium ion cells. By enabling high energy density cathodes to work with cheaper water-based manufacturing methods, CATL has reached a kind of tipping point. The batteries can now go into electric vehicles, which will enable CATL to reach huge scale. And if we look back at the graph from Stanford, this innovation pushes sodium ion batteries further down the cost curve, potentially meaning they'll become cheaper than lithium ion sooner than expected. Due to the higher energy densities possible from these layered oxide cathodes, the second generation battery has already been announced to have a density of 175 watt hours per kilogram, likely rising towards 200 watt hours per kilogram in the not so distant future which seriously rivals lithium ion phosphate. This puts sodium ion on track for applications in electric vehicles, meaning manufacturing can begin to scale and become cheaper. Other literature I found also points towards the fact the discharge curve could become much flatter thanks to the addition of the antimony. It also generally just shifts the voltage curve up compared to traditional layered oxide cells resulting in better voltages for the power electronics. It's important to remember here that lithium ion cells have had decades of breakthroughs to get to the point they're at now. With more and more advancements coming, I expect sodium ion to become a serious player in the coming decade. In the meantime, CATL will possibly subsidize the price of their batteries to ensure they reach the needed scale and dominate the growing market. This is great news for both the energy and transport sectors who will both benefit from cheap and more sustainable and safer sodium ion batteries. I expect it will be a decade or more until we see a noticeable market share forming for sodium ion as the price gets reliably below lithium. But I think we've crossed a tipping point which will be very exciting to see unfold many things will start to become possible as the price of batteries heads below $25 per kilowatt hour, as predicted by the Stanford study. I'm excited to see what happens now thanks to this high density, low cost sodium ion cathode coming to market. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. It's free and helps the channel a lot. You might also like some of my other videos like this one on a new dual rotor electric motor. And as always, thanks for watching.